Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today's session on uh, platform-based SOC design opportunities for emerging economies. Uh, I am Omar Inam, a part of FOSS Alumni Association North America. Uh, we have our distinguished guest Rahil Khan with us, who took uh, who, who's taking his uh, who's uh, taking this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, we're really thankful for him uh, for taking time for all of us. Also, we have um, Rafael Chaudhary uh, on, the, on the line. Um, he is a president for the Alumni Association in North America. I'm going to request Rafael to quickly give an uh, introduction about uh, the FAST Alumni Association North America, its mission, and then we will begin uh, the session. Uh, Rafael? Aslam, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in time. Uh, uh, this we're expecting a house full for this session. So I'll just do a quick introduction. So I'm not in the way of the amazing content today. Uh, we, uh, FAST Alumni Association, is a registered IRS charity. Uh, we actually uh, raise funding for um, scholarship at FAST. Uh, and last year we raised more than um, uh, 100k plus for our scholarships uh, across North America. Uh, we have 20 plus chapters. So if you move to North America, whether it be US or Canada, just be in touch with us and we'll, uh, appropriate, we'll put you in the appropriate group uh, of people uh, so they can be part of your success. Meanwhile, while you're at FAST, um, if you need anything from us, feel free to reach out to us. So uh, now I'm handing it back over to Umar uh, for the introduction of Rahil. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Rafael. Um, so, so Rahil, I think you can uh, take it from here uh, uh, with your introduction and um, why this topic is important. If you could uh, give your point of view, uh, you and I spoke. We met a few months ago in in a in a in a, in a networking event, and I found your work to be very inspiring, especially uh, the way you are. Um, expanding the ecosystem in Pakistan relative to uh, the semiconductor industry. Uh, so I appreciate if you could uh, introduce yourself, uh, give your point of view about the importance of this topic and take the discussion forward. Uh, thank you, Umar. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Um, my name is Rahil Khan. I'm uh, uh, you know, the CEO and founder of Accelerium. Um, we're a fabulous semiconductor company working in uh, the space of communication and sense. Um, but the topic of, of our discussion today is not about Accelerium, but about some of the experiences uh, that, that we have gained <clears throat> in an attempt to uh, work on the ground in Pakistan with the field of SOC design. Uh, so brief uh, introduction uh, about my background. I've been working in the field of um, uh, silicon design for um, my entire career, in fact. I've had the privilege of uh, being part of um, prestigious organizations. Um, I was part of the pre-IPO team at Broadcom uh, very early in my career, uh, later on. Um, I had the good fortune of being of leading cellular modem development at Qualcomm for seven generations, and I was playing as a, and I was a vice president of engineering uh, when I was recruited by uh, Intel Corporation to lead their uh, cellular chipset division, uh, doing similar work. Um, over the years and over the course of my career, I've had um, the opportunity earlier. Uh, to work in Pakistan, uh, more on that um, uh, at another uh, uh, later. But more recently, um, this has been a topic that's been you know near and dear to uh, to my heart, as I'm sure it is to many of you. Which is that are there opportunities for um, uh, you know SOC modern SOC design work in in, in Pakistan? And uh, um, as I mentioned, I had the opportunity to uh, work on this. Um, in a practical way in recent years, and I'd like to share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, uh, so without further ado, let's first uh, begin by um, uh, by answering the question of what, what, is, uh, uh, what is an SOC? Uh, so more, SOC stands for a system on a chip. Uh, so um, system on chip devices are found everywhere, you know, from, um, uh, you know, to um, self-driving cars, to supercomputers, uh, laptops, um, drones, um, smartwatches, in fact, have um, 
uh, have um, um, you know, system on a chip device uh, powering them, uh, virtual reality headsets, uh, cell phones, uh, smartphones, um, and of course robots, etc., and, and everything in between. Uh, so uh, system on a chip is synonymous with uh, you, you know silicon chips uh, these days, uh, just given the complexity of devices that exist. Uh, so on the left you see an example from a, a Tesla full self-driving chip that uh, Tesla uh, you know released in 2019. It's uh, fairly representative of a modern SoC uh, built in a Samsung 14 nanometer FinFET process. Uh, it's uh, uh, 260 square millimeters on a die, uh, contains six billion transistors, um, and uh, it, and it's, it occupies uh, 37.5 millimeters square uh, in terms of package uh, space uh, in a flip chip bulk bulk grid array. Um, so some of these things, don't worry about it. They don't make sense to you. The big picture here is that uh, that Tesla shown there would likely have this chip designed by an enterprise, a non-traditional chip supplier, an OEM in this case, that's seeking to build value by integrating a lot of uh, customized content in their system on a chip device. In this case, the, the system on a chip device contains um, uh, camera interfaces, it contains image sensor process, image signal processor, video encoder, it contains GPUs for graphics rendering, uh, and also two neural network accelerators for machine learning, all right? And uh, 12, uh, you know, high performance CPUs for system management. Uh, and in fact, two 64 bit DDR, uh, you know, four interfaces. The specifics here, this is fairly representative. Um, you know, chips these days, um, uh, there have been chips as big as 4,000 square millimeters of uh, wafer scale chips that have, uh, you know, some startups have, uh, have demonstrated, uh, but a few hundred square millimeter. Um, Xilinx has chips that are 600 square millimeter wide. So these are, are fairly complex devices, highly integrated. And um, in fact, anything in the modern, uh, uh, you know, electronic system, um, um, pretty much everything is powered by some sort of an SOC. Um, so what is a platform-based SOC? So as um, on the bottom right figure, uh, you know, presents the, the famous, uh, uh, you know, Moore's law which basically states that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. And it's been remarkably, we have been remarkably consistent in being able to, you know, track Moore's law historically. And if you just look at where we are in 2020, we're at about 50 billion or so transistor capacity on a chip, very, very complex. Um, so, the, so as chips have become complex, the methodology for designing chips um, you know, has evolved. We went from you know ASICs uh, that were fixed function to system on a chip devices many years ago, and then about 10 years ago uh, there was a transition, or, or 10 to 15 years ago, uh, from um, SOCs to platform-based SOCs. The drivers are, and what is a platform-based SOC? I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but the drivers are increasing gate count, uh, increasing clock speed. Again, you, you keep, we keep push, pulling more and more complexity into this, the, the same size die. And we have to develop methodologies that allow us to do that in a reasonable time. Features are increasing, complexity is increasing. At the same time, there's a desire to reduce <clears throat> time to silicon and time to market. So what this means is uh, that now we are no longer thinking in terms of discrete components in this system on a chip, but we're thinking in terms of subsystems. And there's a lot of emphasis in reusing entire subsystems and also reusing software. Uh, so it's not no longer block reuse is no longer good enough. Um, the other thing that platform-based SOCs, uh, you know, encourage um, are uh, standard interfaces. Uh, you, you will see AMBA, AXI, and, and a few other standards that uh, dominate here. Um, and there is a uh, more, you know, complex system of uh, networks on chip that have emerged to, to make it systemic. Um, and interestingly and significantly, there's a lot of automation generators, core generators, et cetera, that are being used to configure uh, parameterization so to avoid manual error. So in many cases, we are moving towards an integration approach that's correct by construction it's composed of subsystems that are, you know, that are evolving in a very controlled way. 
And this it allows us to take uh, a complex specification and in a reasonable time frame, create these very, very complex and powerful system on chip devices. Um, so is this, a, uh, is this a big enough problem to worry about, right? Hey, so cool. So chips are very cool, to, you know, but is this uh, interesting from a business perspective? Um, so here's a, a depiction of the global value chain for semiconductor, you know, devices. And we're focusing on actually a very, uh, you know, targeted component, uh, you know, from design to fabrication, to packaging assembly and test, um, right? So the big picture here, we can go through and we can talk about just this slide for half an hour, I won't do that. Uh, but I, it is, some things are very, very quickly um, obvious when we start looking at this. First of all, there is a very good reason why we separate these three, uh, you, you know, uh, phases, if you will, of development. Um, a lot of the work in terms of design is still dominated by the U.S. Um, China is emerging very fast there, uh, but U.S. and uh, you know, though South Korea and Taiwan are also um, you, you know uh, um, player playing there, but clearly the U.S. dominates the mind share in terms of the front end design uh, of chips. Um, but when it comes to actual production and fabrication. Um, it's actually Taiwan that, that dominates, uh, followed by South Korea. The chip we showed earlier was built on a South, South Korean Samsung fab, um, but TSMC um, Taiwan is, is, is uh, really uh, the, the best and biggest uh, semiconductor company when it comes to fabrication. So this is taking a fully worked out design, uh, design, uh, design uh, if you will, layout, uh, GDS and actually fabricating the chips. Now these chips after fabrication go actually to a different supply chain where they're packaged, they're tested through ATE testers and assembled and, and so on. And then further down the supply chain. Uh, that work has actually, although that happens in Taiwan, uh, you know, and but China is emerging and, and there are also Malaysia is a smaller player there. Uh, but there are different opportunities in these different space. All of them are dominated by a few developed economies uh, with, um, as you might notice that, that even China is not really competitive in wafer fabrication, right? So the, the ability for even United States lags behind, uh, you know, uh, the incumbents for fabrication. So really the opportunities for even developed nations are, are, are fairly, uh, <clears throat> circumscribed. So uh, what Rahil, about? Yes. Rahil, I have a question. Um, so recently in the U.S., we've been hearing a lot of investment in the chip industry. Yes. Um, is 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 this uh, value chain changing due to that? For example, that's an excellent question. Yeah. What, uh, yeah. Yes. 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 So let me quickly address that. So it 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 there is a there is a th th this exactly is what scares people, right? So if you look at Taiwan. Uh, you know, it's uh, more than 65%, I believe, of capacity is dominated by, uh, and the high end is dominated by Taiwan, right, for like advanced process nodes. So there's a desire to onshore, uh, you know, fabricate. There's a lot of money being pumped into fabs in the US, uh, but there is a, a actual, there's a question on how realistic that is and how much time that was that's gonna take. And it's not a money question, it's a, at this stage, it's partly an expertise question, and believe it or not, partly a workforce question. So the the you know uh, the uh, TSMC is uh, investing and in creating uh, opening a five nanometer fab in Arizona, but TSMC has publicly you know questioned the the feasibility of doing that. And to this date, um, you know the U.S. has not quite you know regained its uh, you know leadership status um, in terms of fab. The exception to this one could say until recently was Intel. Intel is, doesn't show up on this because Intel, unlike most uh, fabless semiconductor companies, which are most of the silicon uh, supply chain, in, 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 Intel is an um, integrated device manufacturer, meaning they do the design, they do their own wafer fabrication, they do their own packaging assembly and test. Um, but recently, uh, even Intel has uh, struggled to keep up with uh, TSMC on advanced process notes. And this is a leadership, uh, you know, if you will, mantle that they have actually ceded 
and until they regain and un so it's not clear whether how easy it's going to be to reshore if you will uh the, and rework the supply chain but that's exactly where a lot of the concerns with policymakers lie that the supply chain is uh, uh, really um, very um, um if you will single sourced almost in a few uh, key areas um so what is this, sorry uh, so what does this mean for um, uh, emerging economies like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, right, and 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 others. And Ukraine, I put Ukraine there, um, and so as well. Uh, so um, so the reality is that there is there are only a few places realistically where uh, emerging economies can participate. The good news is that it is possible more and more so uh, for emerging economies to participate in the global uh, SOC, you know, um, uh, silicon supply chain, uh, but that participation has to be at the design level, meaning front end, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, possibly in packaging, assembly and test. In both places, initially, uh, this is going to be in terms of trained engineers. There is a worldwide global shortage of um, trained, uh, you know, engineering talent. Uh, that that is uh, that works on these technologies, um, and and of course with remote working uh, post COVID, you know things have um, become that much easier uh, to to have remote teams and and, and blended organizations. Um, so this opens up the possibility for emerging economies uh, to participate, and frankly, uh, India has already been participating and in, in uh, at least the design capacity in a significant way uh, for uh, uh, for almost two decades. Um, uh, unfortunately, today, um, the footprint of other smaller emerging economies like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and, and Vietnam is, is negligible. And um, uh, but 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 there is an opportunity to participate and it's a significant um, uh, you say window of opportunity that um, in in our estimation um, should be something that they is taken seriously and, and address. And I'm sure this is what's prompting all of the attention in terms of national semiconductor policy in Pakistan and so on, and and etc. Et, et um, so it is definitely a problem worth solving, right? It's a place where uh, there is a, uh, maybe a once in a generation opportunity for a large group of people to participate in, uh, you know, high-end evaluated, uh, you know, um, uh, in, in the supply chain in an evaluated manner. Um, okay. Rahim, yes. Ryan, there's one question on, on the chat. Uh, uh, Numan, uh, if you like, you can unmute and ask your question if it's not addressed in the previous uh, conversation. So um, it is it is being addressed. Uh, uh, what I wanted to understand was that out of the three, where is the barrier to entry the easiest and the hardest? Which one is hardest? Which one is easiest? Yeah, it is a great question. And I'm hoping that I can address that, uh, uh, you, you know, in, in the next couple of slides. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the in a nutshell, I think in the design and uh, verification side of things, I'll, I'll introduce that in my next slide. And in fact, um, maybe a good segue into this slide. <clears throat> so in when it comes to the, the <clears throat> the design aspects, the front end of this, this you know, uh, the this value chain, the design part of it, uh, right? There are different components of design, right? Uh, the different technologies that interplay and that are uh, you know with each other uh, in that design phase, and, um, and so this includes embedded software, right? That runs on those platform, uh, you know, processors that uh, that are make up the platform based SOC. Uh, of course, RTL design, uh, design verification, right? So, so one thing that's not immediately obvious to, to people who start looking at silicon is silicon is designed very much with software, right? So, so that becomes the easiest. That, so that makes the, the better to entry lowest when it comes to design entry and verification because at a certain level, it's a specialized type of software. And a lot of the skills uh, are actually... Uh, very similar in terms of concept and the barrier to entry is not very high. Uh, um, you know, it's actually very low and we'll go through that uh, uh, in, in my next slide as well. 
Um, the other part of this, uh, you know, chain and still still in the design phase are technologies like design for test. Design for test is closely related to test on the on the other side, um, uh, you know, automatic, uh, you know, and D DFT is a specialized field which uh, where there is a shortage and, and there is a, you know, definitely a lot of interest and value to be added. Uh, but this requires getting familiar with design for test methodology and there are a few industry standard tools not very difficult the barrier to entry is still not extremely high it doesn't cost tons of money to to do this kind of work it is very feasible to be done uh, remotely it is being outsourced and in fact uh, right now the most um, uh, if you will the biggest contingent of dft engineers in the world probably is in india um, so up there is also physical design uh, so physical design uh, uh, is takes an RTL uh, on from the left side and actually uses sophisticated uh, compilers like Synopsys, ICC, uh, or Cadence Innovus to uh, actually trans to actually create a layout a GDS two um, through a very complex set of flows. Uh, the tool familiarity and training is a must. And this is um, so. While you don't need PhDs and master's degrees to do this work, uh, but there's a little bit higher barrier to entry because um, you know the, the specialized know-how, and then of course you have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to use these tools. Having said this, also very accessible, um, you know, resource-intensive, a um, lot of hard work needed, and uh, this is another place where um, you know India, in fact, uh, started with physical design in many cases. Uh, on top of that, we're showing emulation. Now, emulation is an interesting field because this is emerging for these complex um, system on a chip devices as a necessary complement to design verification shown below, where design verification is done completely with simulation. Emulation is usually done with FPGAs in one way or the other. Um, so here, of course, you need embedded software skills. Uh, and you also need familiarity with tool flows, um, you know, with FPGA synthesis tool flows. I'm showing that as Vivaro um, and, and um, you know, possibly specialized emulation methodologies like Veloce. Um, again, the barrier to entry here is not very high and uh, it is possible with, a, you know, a relatively modest amount of training and uh, hard work to carve out uh, a space here. And there definitely is need uh, for resources globally and talent in, in this space as well. So these different components interplay with each other. The RTL design, RTL verification go hand in hand from design, uh, RTL design, physical, uh, you know, design, you know, process is uh, tightly coupled. And of course, design DFT and verification and are, are very tightly coupled as is physical design and DFT. And of course, embedded software is not separate from the hardware that's being described. So all of this is the how the modern SOCs are engineered. Uh, most of it is resource intensive. Uh, it does take still uh, lots of people to do um, uh, you, you know, these complex chips. Uh, and the background here is, uh, the good news is, the background is, is not very complex, right? The minimum background required is digital logic design and digital systems, which is part of every undergraduate uh, engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering curriculum. Um, hardware description languages were introduced about 20 years ago in Pakistan as well, and are, uh, are, are understood to be part of the expanded uh, engineering curriculum. So there's familiar, familiarity there not very high barrier to entry. Um, you know, obviously you need good programming skills, right? And uh, you do need to have some understanding of object-oriented design. So really somebody with an electrical or computer engineering or a computer science background should be able to very easily participate in the workforce designing these chips. In addition, it's nice to have VLSI design, but not required. For physical design uh, in particular, it's, it's very good. Computer architecture, uh, especially with RISC-V emerging as a key technology there is, is a very nice to have a background. Uh, data structures, algorithms, again, taught in every undergraduate course in computer science and computer engineering, very nice. Um, internet, interconnect technologies are key. It should be you know, addressed in uh, curriculum. And of course, 
it's good to have project-based experience. So the good news here is that the engineering skills required, uh, the barrier to entry isn't extremely high. You don't need PhDs. You don't need to have, uh, you know, an IQ of 180 and above to do this. Uh, you know, good, solid, hardworking, smart engineers who want to do this work can uh, provide value in a fairly, you know, modest amount of time with a relatively, a, you know, uh, simple background. That said, uh, you know, showing here is my assessment. If I'm assigning a letter grade to the, the engineers that are actually being produced in Pakistan uh, through, uh, and with due respect to all of my colleagues who are part of the academia, uh, this is just our assessment after, um, you know, more than nine months of on the ground, you know, work in Pakistan, interviewing, interacting and doing projects. Um, what we are finding is that depending on the range of the university, the range of skills here um, are really not uh, up, to, up to par and where they need to be. And in some cases, they are just, you know, really, really bad, right? Uh, the quality of engineers being produced. Um, so the, and I think this is partly because the silicon uh, engineering ecosystem is uh, relatively, uh, you know, uh, immature in Pakistan. But the, but the reality is there is a chicken and egg problem here too. Uh, because if we're not producing engineers who have even a modest background, uh, like for example, hardware description languages, proficiency in hardware description languages is really not there when, when, when engineers are graduating uh, from, from, from school. So what that means is companies like um, Lampo Mellon, uh, we've had that, we, we, you, you, some of you may know of that company, uh, you know, Navid Sherwani was involved with that. I mean, they go through the process of training people almost from scratch for a period of time um, and, and so on, which, which makes it very difficult. Uh, things are becoming better. So I don't wanna, you know, uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm an optimistic person and I, I, I think there is a lot of reason for optimism, but uh, good news, um, the barrier to entry isn't very high. Uh, bad news, more work is needed, right? Um, um, okay, so mo moving on. Um, so there are certain new trends that actually help that are very favorable to uh, <clears throat> the, uh, if you will, establishment of a silicon design ecosystem in Pakistan. Um, one of them is uh, this entire open source movement which started with software Many of you are familiar, Linux being the, the best and oldest example of open source success. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a lot of open source software that's, that's available uh, out there and is being used uh, you, you know, in the software industry um, with success. Um, but now recently there's also the emergence of open source hardware. And in particular with RISC-V and open source ISA instructions and architecture, and which has revitalized uh, and produced uh, open source um, system level intellectual property building blocks. So you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and, you know, there are technologies uh, like Chipyard and uh, that, that actually can potentially help um, accelerate and automate, uh, you know, the development of uh, complex subsystems within a platform level SOC. Uh, but there are also other methodologies in cores, uh, complex cores available uh, through uh, Open Hardware Group um, and Linux Foundation um, and um, uh, you, you know, other groups. And I, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but representative. There is substantial amount of fairly good quality, in some cases, excellent quality IP available as a starting point. So you don't have to be left far behind. It is possible to catch up. Uh, the, on the other side, uh, even, uh, you know, one of the misconceptions I've found is people think, well, yeah, okay, so IP is available, but, you know, the CAD tools, EDA, is extremely expensive. There is some truth to that, but the reality is that even that has become extremely accessible, uh, right? You have actually open source tools like Better Later and Coco TV that are Linux Foundation projects now. Uh, that have become uh, pretty much standard um, uh, methodologies in, in modern chip design organizations. 
Uh, there are there are a number of other free and low cost uh, tools available uh, for engineers. So uh, in fact, the reality is that if one wants to get started, it should be possible to get started with uh, a PC and very, very little investment, just a matter of accessing the right resources and having the will to, to, to you know, participate. The barrier to entry therefore is actually um, lowered because of uh, uh, the confluence of all of these methodologies uh, that, 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 uh, we, that are prevalent today. Rahim, uh, yes. there's, there's another question um, uh, that uh, Noman Sheikh wants to ask. Um, sure. Uh, Noman, go ahead if you, if you could. Uh, so uh, Rahil, uh, what I want to understand, um, um, so what is driving this new platform on a chip uh, uh, push? I mean, because as you said, Moore's law has been around since the late 70s, has been consistently improving uh, the uh, uh, processing capability. So that cannot be the primary driver. Uh, yeah. So why now? Uh, what is pushing for these platform-based uh, chips? It's not a new thing. It's actually what has happened is that the system on chip design methodology has evolved into a platform-based design methodology for practical reasons. And uh, the drivers are basically in a nutshell, increased complexity and more and more complex features. So one way of, for example, benefiting from uh, more capacity on the chip is like say to create bigger and bigger memories, like say DDR, you go from, you've seen that, right? We used to be in megabytes and hundreds of megabytes. Now gigabytes and terabytes are possible even in flash drives. So that's one way, right? But a much more complex thing is when we're, we're putting a system on a chip with a lot of complexity, an entire supercomputer or full self-driving car on a chip. So it just takes too long to verify. It takes too long to do. So what, uh, uh, what modern engineering organizations um, have uh, did, you know, moved towards um, uh, is an integration of subsystems uh, approach, which is which we are calling platform-based SOC design, right? Here again, subsystem are reused as opposed to uh, block reuse. Um, right and uh, the, and using integration methodologies like network on chips. So um, that may mean that we are actually investing some percentage of silicon and making things more modular, more object oriented, more system based, more plug and play. Right, and that's really what's driving it. It's complexity. Right. Hopefully that answered that question. Um, but uh, one thing I should mention is that as important as RISC-V, and RISC-V is an extremely eventful and important technology, uh, you know, RISC-V is only one technology in, in, the, in the, if you will, uh, in, in this entire space. And, you, you know, uh, what, what that does is it creates, uh, it defines an instructions and architecture and because an ISA is this undefined with an open source um, royalty free uh, uh, specification, uh, many uh, implementations are available for processors. That's good. But a system on a chip uh, is much more than just processors, right? It's, it's a lot of other devices. As, as again, if I, if I just did, uh, if we go back to this ex simple example, right? You have neural network accelerators, you've got DDR interfaces, you've got GPUs, you've got CPUs, right? So just having a CPU space, and, and then more, and more importantly, a system of networks on chip that connect things, ISPs, video encoders. So, you, you have to have the competency to be able to pull these complex subsystems together and understand how these technologies interplay uh, and contribute to them, right? Uh, so it's more risk five as important as it is, uh, is, 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 is only a part of this larger, uh, you know, drive towards more complex, uh, you know, platform level SOCs built around uh, systemic, uh, you know, uh, some systems that are, uh, you know, modular and um, um, uh, and uh, scalable, and and a lot of open source uh, reliance and and, and IP uh, as well as software. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did as a result of our discussions, because I'll go back actually to this slide. Uh, well, we realized 
uh, that it should be possible. The barrier to entry uh, for engineering, SOC engineering, isn't that high, really. It should be, you know, a plentiful supply of, you know, hard, smart, English speaking, well educated, you know, young engineers in emerging economies. And we started working um, both in Pakistan, actually, and in Bangladesh as well. Um, and then in an attempt to uh, to to actually evaluate in a, on the ground, right? How or what the reality is, and one of the things we found is that there, there really isn't um, availability of the right type of skill set in you know fresh engineers, and actually in the ecosystem as a result. Um, so one thing that came out of that uh, was this concept of a, a of a Nova open source platform, and I'll only talk about it briefly. Uh, but this is an example of a teaching project that uh, that we've created uh, with uh, some local universities in Pakistan. Uh, we're trying out uh, in a bid to provide um, a means for students to actually practice working in a complex uh, platform level SOC environment where there are processors and uh, you know subsystems around them. Because if you don't have the opportunities and this, as, as students within the educational institutions and the companies don't exist, how do you break this chicken and egg problem? So one of the solutions we came up with was to actually you know, have a pilot project called NOVA, uh, which is actually done and completely implemented on a, a, a Amazon Cloud FPGA. And this is work that's been done 100% you know, executed by students. Um, though under the guidance of industry mentors, um, Exilidium uh, is contributing uh, IP and technology, open sourcing uh, some of our uh, technology to facilitate this. We're also helping with, um, uh, with the uh, industry mentorship, um, but it is, uh, you know, interestingly a project which is being done in Pakistan by students, undergraduate students as part of their undergraduate coursework. Uh, so it represents a, uh, I think, an interesting approach. Uh, we can talk more about this. Um, uh, you know, though this is not the focus of our discussion today, the reason uh, we're talking about, um, uh, I think, these these types of projects are actually what are needed, because uh, you know, if we see a gap in skill sets and you know the ecosystem doesn't today exist, then a way of uh, spurring that is by actually doing projects that are representative and not just doing something that may have been relevant 20 years ago, but is um, quickly outdated. Um, the focus in the NOVA project is latest open source tools and low cost development methodology. Uh, students are actually booting Linux on a processor, um, right? This is a RISC-V RB64GC processor uh, that is uh, uh, open source as well. Um, and system Verilog, it's, this is being done with system Verilog. Uh, people, students are using Verilator, which is an open source simulation technology we spoke about earlier. The entire design is running, uh, you know, software on uh, this, this platform on um, AWS Cloud FPGA, which is a very, very low cost way to get hands-on experience in hardware, right? You don't even need to buy thousands of dollars worth of FPGA boards. You can rent them by the hour at Amazon. And this project is intended to be used for teaching and research. And our intent is to expose students to, uh, you know, a modern hardware design verification and even later on physical design methodologies. Um, also, a more modern firmware and embedded software, especially as it relates to the lower level firmware and embedded software that's used for platform level SSCs. Um, and also, Practical AI and machine learning applications, right? Working on, uh, uh, right? And, and at the same time, working in a cloud environment, which is very typical these days, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, NOVA 1 is currently underway, and there are discussions with uh, several universities for uh, follow on NOVA projects. So, you know, stay tuned on that. Um, again, this is open source, non commercial effort, which, which is just uh, our way of, you know, contributing to the ecosystem, which brings us to the you know, final topic where I, I'll, I'll stop um, after this slide, which is that for those who are interested in getting started with SOC engineering in Pakistan, where do you start, right? So if you're a student, um, if you're a, you may be an educator, uh, you may be, um, you know, in industry participant, a well-wisher, maybe even an investor, where do you get started? So for students, uh, first and foremost, the good news is, 
um, it is very accessible to you. All the resources are uh, available on the internet. You know, you've got to dig in deep and be self-reliant, right? And, uh, you know, don't wait on others. You, you bust, but you must master the basics. You may have been exposed to them, but make sure that you master technologies like languages like System Verilog, Python, and C, uh, right? There's really no reason you can't do that on your own, though it would be nice if uh, educational institutions did a better job of preparing you. Um, digital logic design courses, really, go back, read your books, you know, learn it, learn it well, right? Master the basics. Um, then all these wonderful open source tools, right? That don't cost a dime, right? Learn them, right? They will really help you get initiated with, with this wonderful and very significant, valuable, uh, you, you know, field. Um, again, better later, uh, you know, Xilinx Vivaro tools are free, Coco TV, wonderful test bench methodology, Linux Foundation project, learn them. Right, it doesn't cost a dime. Anyone can do it. All you need is a computer. Um, gain hands-on experience. Right, uh, there are options. There's Google Summer of Code. There are students in Pakistan who have done actually very good work uh, with Google Summer of Code. Um, then there's Nova, right, which we're you know projects like that that are, that are I'm sure there are others like that. Gain hands-on experience, and the more relevant it is, the better. So for students, my message would be, if you're interested in getting, um, you know, starting with SOC engineering, really, th there is nothing stopping you. And, and we can help. I mean, when I say we, uh, I, I am actually taking the opportunity to speak on behalf of those who are industry practitioners and uh, the wider community. But students, really, don't wait, right? Do it on your own, right? That's, and, and others are doing it, you can do it. Um, Educators, uh, very well-meaning, uh, uh, you know, educators and very smart people uh, exist in Pakistan. I've been have had the privilege to get to know a lot of you, so I know there is no shortage of well-wishing and smart people in in, in academia. Uh, so I think there are simple things we can talk offline. Uh, we are doing uh, that you can do to help. Right, you are a key participant in this ecosystem in the absence of industry. Uh, updated curriculum is something that should be very easy. If there is a will, we can help. Uh, there are many other people who, who can, but we are happy to help. And, and there are already, you know, um, uh, educators in Pakistan who are uh, a step ahead. And we, you know, to make sure that students that are graduating know the system very long. They understand technologies like RISC-V, very important on-chip buses, you know, Git, right? Some simple things like Git, Python, C. This is not really that difficult. And there's really no excuse why if there's a will, we cannot make sure that students get exposed to it. And those who are willing to put in the work uh, are become really good at doing this by the time they graduate with an undergraduate degree. Um, one way of doing that, I my recommendation is to focus on hands-on projects. There are far too few. Right, you can't just, it's not about an intellectual exercise of understanding the concepts of error law. That's good, that's necessary, not sufficient. One doesn't learn programming by learning the theory of programming. It's by writing programs and at the end of the day, hardware design is software, right? Uh, system error law, uh, Python, C, really hands-on projects. Uh, this could be projects in classes, um, senior design projects, uh, again, Nova is a teaching project. If you if you're interested, we can talk. Right, there are already colleagues uh, of yours who are, who are who are doing that, and that was really intended as an example project. When people said, "Well, what could we do as a project?" We said, "Well, here's here is one example." The other thing is there is a lot of interest in SOC tape outs. Well, in tape outs in Pakistan right now, um, I, I've been hearing a lot about it. Uh, but really, guys, my recommendation would be make sure that you're collaborating together to do SOC tape outs, not just in ASIC tape out. That's okay. Any tape out is good. But what's better is something that's done which has a requisite level of complexity, or done with more advanced methodologies, which are accessible. And I would recommend inter university collaboration uh, until the ecosystem stabilizes and becomes bigger. Uh, and but focus on the level of complexity. Don't just settle for doing really small, small devices that may have been sufficient a couple of decades ago. Today, the state of the art has evolved. And I think our education 
uh, process must evolve with it. Again, I'm I'm calling it as I see it. So please, no offense meant to anyone. Um, last, uh, my audience um, is those uh, uh, more people like me who are industry observers, participants, well-wishers, and maybe investors. Um, so what, what, how can you do? What can you do to help? I actually think there's a big role to play, right? Uh, first and foremost, invest in the ecosystem, right? Invest in the ecosystem by sponsoring things like sponsoring student projects, um, offering internships, um, you know, even contributing open source IP, right? If you are a participant, you're doing, you have your own, you know, chip design company in Silicon Valley, you know, somebody like us, we, we were able to find ways to contribute IP that wasn't really core to what we're doing, but really helped in the ecosystem in Pakistan, find out ways of doing that. Find a way to invest in the ecosystem in Pakistan if you wanted to, uh, to, to, to grow. grow. Try outsourcing. Right? There are a few companies, very few in Pakistan, that are actually uh, offering services right now. Um, take a risk, right? Um, and I won't name names. I don't want to be calling, you know, uh, picking winners there. Uh, but there are local companies that are trying. It's still in its infancy. It, you know, quality isn't quite there. But hey, hey take a risk. Uh, we have to, um, and uh, uh, and that might in turn allow you to gain access to local talent in Pakistan. And I will tell you, there is no shortage of raw talent, right? Uh, just like any other part of the world, Pakistan has been blessed and endowed with its share of talent. Uh, for investors, right? If you, if you really are looking for a groundbreaking um, opportunity, launch ventures in Pakistan, take a risk, right? Um, because there is actually a huge value in in uh, in uh, that may be uh, accessible here, uh, uh, you know it is still early days, uh, but I do believe that in the next few years uh, the opportunities will become uh, possible. Certainly, it's possible to do engineering services relatively easily with Pakistan. The barrier to entry isn't that high, and the level of investment required isn't high. The next level uh, I expect will be some possibility for doing silicon IP based uh, companies that are developing IP and licensing them. Um, that's possible in Pakistan. It may over time also be possible to do chiplets and ASICs, but frankly, the ecosystem has to mature a bit more. We are, we are far, far from that today, but maybe in a few years we can get there. Uh, so my last in summary message is that there is a significant global opportunity, right, for emerging economies in general, for Pakistan specifically, but a lot of work is still needed, and it will take efforts by everybody, all those people who are interested in helping, students, educators, uh, you know, well-wishers, industry engineers working, you know, worldwide, like like the alumni of uh, of um, uh, FAST, and um, people who might be interested in investing, invest, participate. That's that's my uh, that's my final message. Thank you. So I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Rahel. Great, uh, great insight uh, and, and, and guidance uh, based on your experiences. Uh, we do have a couple of folks on the chat um, uh, have uh, asked some questions. Uh, Rafael, if you're on, uh, we, we, you can go first and ask your question. Shazia. Okay, so the question that I have, the great insight. So Rahil, then thank, thank you Umar for organizing the webinar and Rahil for sharing these insights. So I think one question that we, probably get asked a lot is that you do you think that there are significant opportunities for chip designers in Pakistan and when I say that I personally visited a few labs you know uh, in fall and uh, the students there even the master students the opportunities that they were eyeing were mostly you know either in China or western countries because the the most of the things that they they, they they tell us is there's obviously lack of infrastructure funding, like the projects that are actually vetted by the government of Germany, they're actually, try, actually 
saying that we'll match the funding as well for those projects, but they're not finding the local support for that. So majority of the talent that we are actually producing in um, chip designing actually gets ends up getting exported. So uh, just wanted some insights there, you know, how do you see that? How, how can we retain that talent inside? Maybe we cannot enter the manufacturing space, but like, how can we retain the design talent? The so I, I think it's a great question. So if the question is that how can, is there, are there job opportunities in the chip design space for uh, engineers in Pakistan? And yes, they definitely are, are uh, or, or there should be. Uh, there are, uh, and there should be more of them, and, and this would be for engineers working in Pakistan, right? So we have to look at the example uh, from India, right? Uh, India, yes, has exported a lot of talent to uh, United States, to the European Union, uh, right? But the reality is that a lot of work happens in India today uh, related to chip design. And this is uh, in, you know, again, design, verification, physical design, all of the disciplines that we, we discussed, right? All of these uh, disciplines shown here um, have participation from India. This is in, in Indian engineers sitting in India working and providing services, however, for clients that are international. Uh, I personally, uh, am skeptical about the scope of doing a chip design a ecosystem that's purely designing products for consumption in Pakistan. I think that has actually, uh, it will take time. The best place to start is to realize that the $100 billion in the design phase that's being, you know, uh, uh, that market is, is a global market dominated by uh, the United States, uh, European Union, um, uh, you know, and China, right? And so you have to go uh, to some extent uh, either where the jobs are or, or provide services to the companies that are doing products there. So the easiest and the lowest, you know, way of participating for engineers in Pakistan is to be part of uh, global engineering design services uh, houses that are providing uh, you know, services here. And also this, the same is true for packaging assembly and test to some extent. Uh, and and it's, it's, th that goes back to the question of where do you, do you start? The easiest place to start is there. The next best thing after that, moving up the food chain would be uh, silicon IP which uh, by the way is a $7 billion industry in and of itself, uh, currently dominated by the United States um, and UK if you do arm, um, but uh, uh, there is opportunity for participation from emerging economies, including Pakistan. Hopefully I answered the question. Thank you, Rahil. Um, we, we you have a couple yeah, so I think I'll, I'll just end up with a follow-up. I think we, I, I'll, I think we, we need to chat that about offline because one of the things that we keep on also hearing is that they obviously as you, you you're showing there the, you know wafer fabrication of you know just 16 nanometer 12 nanometer I think based on what I know in Pakistan we can't even import less than 130 uh, nanometer right so they were trying to import 65 nanometer even for research they can't do that so that's that's those are the challenges I believe the people are having, but I think uh, I, 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 I mean, actually I don't understand that point, right? Because it just like the IT industry in Pakistan, there are 1200 uh, houses, software houses in Pakistan providing IT services mostly to a global clientele, right? So, similarly, uh, you know, a software, you know, you know, services model that's providing services to companies based in UK and China does not require engineers to import any machinery or export anything. It's software. At the end of the day, design work for SOC, think of it, it's all software, right? So software can be done. This is a specialized type of software which should be accessible. And in fact, in India, that is, that is what's happening. I'm happy to talk offline and exchange mm -hmm. further thoughts. Thank you, Rahil. Um, uh, Ali Raza, if you're, uh, if you're still here, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, so my question to Sir Rahil is, uh, there's been a lot of talk like regarding the lack of, uh, you know, trained engineers and train right mindsets for the development of next generation SOCs and all that stuff. I have been following, yeah, I've been following the latest uh, technological advancements, you know, in the US and in the European Union, and they're investing so much in, you know, uh, quantum chips. Uh, they haven't been yet, you know, 
uh, commercialized yet they are working on it yeah. but uh, the these chips the quantum chips you know they can drive ai models and machine learning models way better and quicker than you know digital systems so how far so this soc digital design industry can go until yeah. that quantum chips you know yeah. comes into play and so uh, i actually don't agree with the premise of the question uh, i think quantum uh, technology is probably at least 10 years away from commercialization it's still in the research era at yeah, yeah exactly for exactly, some yeah. problems yeah it's not here and now and uh, you know uh, so we don't see we don't expect the silicon uh, and and for that even from an application perspective only a very limited set of applications have been demonstrated to work well with quantum computers make no mistake at some point there is a disruption coming there but i wouldn't count uh, silicon engineering out just yet uh, and the idea that we're just going to sit back we could one approach could be sit back and wait for quantum computers to solve all problems with software writing software the question is how are we participating in the value chain so my my view on this is this is here and now the level of investment required here is not like research in ground breaking technologies like quantum computers this is very simple stuff this is vocational training we need to invest in vocational training so that we have the requisite background skills to participate in a global economy that's continuing to evolve and compound in complexity Thank, uh, thank yes so i have a question yeah follow back sure. uh, yeah if, if i can uh sure ali go ahead yeah so you were saying that those you know those technologies are for the very specific and niche applications right i mean at some point right now they haven't been proven there is no commercialization of quantum computers and uh, yeah, right so i think you can so those in my uh, humble opinion are not opportunities that are open to emerging economies like pakistan and bangladesh so those are things that are best left to more advanced economies like the united states and china like quantum computers specifically nanotechnology etc it's just way too ambitious uh, uh for that matter i also don't believe that it's a good idea for pakistan to invest in setting up fans that's my personal opinion uh, if that's a proposal i think there are practical steps to participate in this huge economy in a way that uh, you know makes sense that you know and and to me th- these are some things i'm sure there are other ideas thank you rahil um so we have a couple more questions ahmed nafil aslam you can unmute and ask your question uh, sir first of all thank you very much for such a uh technically enriched and informative talk uh, sir i have a questions that you talk about that uh, there is a huge potential in outsourcing uh, the design for test dft uh, yes. uh, so kindly uh, a little bit uh, explain it uh, uh, in detail and my second question actually i am an educationist and uh, uh, and basically uh, uh, there is a, there is a perception in pakistan that the tools which we need teachers and students they are very expensive uh, and the, uh, yeah. the low cost tools which are available on which we can do the uh, hands on training uh, they have limited capability and capacity their functionality is not that much which have a huge company uh, has in united states or in any other developed country so can uh, we can train on that low cost tools which are you know students uh, versions and they have a, they have a limited yeah. uh, functionality and when we take uh, uh, outsource body from industry then uh, can we able to cope that yes yes those are, those are good questions actually so let me take the the question of tool costs right so the discipline shown in this picture on the left side specifically embedded software rtl design design verification um, though they benefit from uh, you know more expensive tools they right but the reality is they don't require expensive tools at all i mean c c c++ assembly running on linux in a cloud environment uh, is on instructions and simulators that thanks to risk 5 are open source right and and free it, it means embedded software really can be uh, largely developed there uh and i would mention 
also emulation with FPGAs, right? And and by the way, just as an example, going back to the reason we did Nova was actually to exactly show what can be done, right? So here this on this FPGA, we have a platform that has a advanced uh, RV64 GC processors and application class processor that's booting Linux running on an FPGA uh, and uh, uh, it's doing the, you know, matrix, there is a matrix multiply accelerator doing, you know, um, basically AI acceleration. Uh, we are running AI applications on this processor uh, with TensorFlow Lite. Um, and, uh, and, and, and all of this is running on AWS Cloud FPGA. So you don't even need an expensive FPGA again to get started. And these these are uh, this is a complex chip that does use AXI protocol and AXI interconnects and students are learning about really relevant technologies both design and verification. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in my view, it is actually possible to get gain a lot of the you know background and experience maybe not all of it with open source and relatively low cost technologies and that is really why for Nova we picked exactly. <clears throat> those technologies that are accessible and they don't require millions of dollars of CAD tools. Uh, for um, physical design, uh, you do need um, a Synopsys IC compiler or Cadence Synopsys, <clears throat> which <clears throat> I believe are licenses that are available. But when I talk to our colleagues in, in universities in Pakistan, they are not sure what to do with those, right? So uh, I think accessibility of tools, in my view, is not the barrier at this point. And we can talk offline on that yeah. too, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Rahil. Uh, we have run out of time. Um, if Rahil, you can answer one more question, uh, okay. then we can ask uh, Uzair Rashid Daoud to unmute and ask. Uzair, are you there? Hello. Hello, Mr. Rahil. Sir, uh, my uh, question was more like pertaining to time. As you yes. mentioned that uh, it is significantly easy to access resources that are available online, open source resources. Yes. My question was that there is always a fear that we contribute a significant portion of our attention to um, learning all these resources and yes. uh, the platform industry in Pakistan not actually reaching that perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'll go back to the question is that is it possible that we spend all this effort and students learning, you know, mastering the basics of Verilog or any of these things that I mentioned, right? Uh, and, and then there's no opportunity in Pakistan. Yes, it's possible. So I think everyone to some extent has to invest, uh, right? Uh, and investment means that there is a risk. But honestly, what is the risk? that if students learn this valuable technology and there aren't applicability of skills in Pakistan, there is a huge world of opportunities with hundreds of thousands of vacancies across the globe. So I, for one, uh, I'm, I, in fact, I, I will you know, say that I have been observing the Pakistani silicon design industry efforts for more than 20 years now. And I've been participating in them at, at, a, at some level. Um, and what I've observed is over the course of my career, anyone who's invested in this has really benefited, right? It's, it's, there's no downside for students, right? So that's the thing, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I think it's possible that the Pakistani engineers go down this uh, rabbit hole and make an investment and they find out, well, low, the jobs in Pakistan aren't there. That's why I don't think it's only students, right, uh, that can do this. I think the industry um, uh, and investors have to also step in. And, and I think it's the elements are in place mostly. It'll take a little bit of effort, but I'm very optimistic that a viable um, you know, ecosystem for silicon design is uh, possible in Pakistan. All right. Uh, thank you, Rahil, for uh, give, giving us this opportunity to hear your point of view and for taking our questions. Um, and, and thank you for the audience uh, for the engagement and uh, uh, questions. Uh, we will be uh, sending you all the recording of the session. Uh, please take time to uh, replay as you need and share with others. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. So.